Still okay. says over there on mine. Are you sure you started? Ours, ours says it's live. Okay. <laughs> Very good. That is better. <laughs> now, I'm, now we're going live. So uh, I understand Nico's away. He's, he, he, he mailed me. So you guys are doing uh, well. I can only see you and one other person. Are there more people in the room? Oh, let me, uh, let me adjust the there camera. All right. Good. There you go. A little bit closer. Good. So, yeah, come on so we can see everybody. So, I, you know, tonight I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about something that um, I, years ago I helped translate and I made a big impression on me and I saw it again yesterday. And I think it's very helpful. And the distinction that's made in the spiritual life for us and helps us is a good example for us to, uh, to go a little deeper. And the aim in these talks is, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things we can talk about. We can talk about today's the, the ninth day after the... Uh, Kimi Singh, the tradition. We could talk about the tradition around that, but I think a lot of that's available. You can you can get that online. And so my uh, my interest is to give you a little bit, uh, let's say, some insights, some, something to think about and reflect upon in terms of our spiritual life, of our our personal uh, spiritual struggle, because a lot of us um, have zeal, have fire. Um, but we don't have a lot of knowledge. We don't have a lot of examples around us. And so we don't have a lot of uh, knowledge in terms of uh, making more distinctions and deeper in spiritual life. So I'm going to quote, I'm going to read a little bit about from an uh, excerpt from the life of the Elder Paisios. How many people have read that, that life? It's been circulating for a couple of years now. Let me see. I've got one hand. Dino? I've no. <laughs> uh -huh. So. So this will be new for a lot of you then. That's good. Uh, there's a chapter in that book called The Aroma of Reverence. And first of all, before we even get down to, in, in the reading the text to make some distinctions, uh, Elder Paisios in his, in his life made a distinction between reverence and piety, or in Greek, evlavia and evsevia. Evlavia, we translated in the life of Elder Paisios as reverence. And Evsevia, we translated as piety. Now, uh, for Elder Paisios, St. Paisios, as to say, uh, Evlavia uh, is something positive, good. It's a virtue. It's one of the greatest virtues. Uh, and in fact, it's something that makes all the other virtues, um, uh, gives them, let's say, uh, strength, power, and, and accentuates them. So it's a, it's a basis in the spiritual life of love or reverence. And then he would speak derogatory or in disdain, with disdain for what he called um, evsevia, uh, which you know, could be used positively, but he used it negatively, uh, as a kind of um, external, formal uh, piety, um, which uh, we might say... Um, in Greek, uh, pietism. I'm sorry, in English, we might call it something like pietism, something negative, where, where the, the focus is on the externals, focuses on what, I, what I'm like, what I appear, what people see me as, uh, and that's not, that's not a spiritual state, that's a state of uh, pride, usually, or delusion. So, so that, when I'm going to read this text, you, but you have to keep that in mind, that which the reverence is evlavia in Greek, and Piety in this text is Evsevia, which is a negative thing. And we'll talk about uh, some of the details, uh, and then we can open up for questions and answers. So this is from the life uh, by Elder Isak. It's a small, small excerpt. Once a recluse ascetic who had heard a lot about Elder Paisios came to visit him. They talked for a while, and he ascertained that Elder Paisios was an exceptionally reverent man. Indeed, the elder had a reverence, which he had learned from his parents and mainly his mother. While at the monastery, the elder was at a monastery before he went to the cell and lived on his own. While at the monastery, he benefited from many of the fathers and especially from a particular higher monk. He would say of that, we can't reach the reverence that he had. It's impossible. He would celebrate liturgy every day and he struggled greatly. Once for a half a year, he ate nothing but a but half of a small prosphora, 
and a few tomatoes dried in the sun. When he would serve the chapels, this reverend priest, like other priests in the monastery, preferred to have as the chanter the young uh, young Father Evercios, that was Elder Paisos, St. Paisos was his name when he was a, a rasophore, I think, or a, a novice, uh, as the elder was then called. The elder had an innate reverence, but he also cultivated it a great deal. He placed such emphasis on it that he once said that reverence is the greatest virtue because it attracts the grace of God. So the elder reverence was the fear of God and the spiritual sensitivity. Reverent people behave carefully and modestly because they intensely feel the presence of God. Let me stop here and comment on that. Uh, you notice um, that uh, he saw it as the great, one of the greatest virtues because it attracts the grace of God. So it, everything we're doing in the, in the spiritual life and in the, in the church is aimed at attracting the grace of God. In other words, you becoming unified, becoming united with God. That's what it means to attract the grace of God. It means to be united with God. But for there to be no between us and God, for us to be united. And the sign of a person who has attracted the grace of God is reverence. And reverent people, what they do, they're careful and they're modest. Now, modesty is something in our culture that is greatly lacking. And in fact, we don't really ever talk about modesty much. And most people aren't modest. And most people think modesty is something that, you know, is, is for, you know, um, let's say, uh, really conservative, uh, you know, old-fashioned, you know, backwards Protestants or something. I mean, modesty has been so degraded and so misunderstood that we really don't we don't understand how important it is. But he sees here signs of a reverend person, a person who has attracted the grace of God, a person who's becoming holy, in other words, of God, modesty and carefulness. Modesty in Greek is semnotita. And modesty in Greek uh, is much broader than what we think of in English because of the Protestant influence in our language in English and because it was reduced a lot, for the most part to what we wear or how we appear if we're covered up or if we're, you know, more uh, have, you know, naked and sh skin is showing. But modesty is a much, much uh, deeper and broader in the Orthodox Christian tradition and it, it's very closely connected to humility. And so the humble person is the modest, modest person, and the modest person is a humble person. And so uh, modesty can also be used um, uh, not thinking greatly of oneself, not wanting to appear in uh, uh, as, as great, uh, important. Uh, uh, he was very modest. Uh, he de declined the offer, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's, that's a broader use of the term as opposed to just the physical, um, you know, uh, covering of someone. So just wanted to focus on that because we probably would have passed by it without thinking much of it, that uh, how important modesty uh, and, and then care for somebody who's very careful. This is also something we can work on in terms of being careful, being a persectiki, careful in our movements, in the way we talk, uh, you know, many of us are abrupt. We cut people off when they're talking. We, we don't, we're inconsiderate or we're, um, uh, we can be, become easily. All these things uh, undercut reverence and uh, uh, show that a person is not careful. And he means, I think, mainly in his thoughts, but also in his actions. So we take care uh, uh, to um, be mindful our thoughts, and then we're going to be careful in terms of our actions. So let's continue on a bit and see, uh, read some more excerpt. The, uh, the other one is to be unaffected and internal. Uh, just on that unaffected, you know, there's a way you can, you can affect things, affectation, and then there's a natural way of, of, of acting, uh, or, or there's an being inhibited and uninhibited. So, um, which is not exactly the same thing, but the person who is naturally reverent, that's, that's different than somebody who's putting it on. And so that's part of the distinction that he's making between uh, Evlavia and Evsevia or uh, reverence and piety. 
He turned away from mere external forms. Regarding a group of monks who had great order and discipline in their liturgical life, he commented, I respect that, if it is something that comes from within. The elders' conduct was reverent, but with a freedom that was dry forms. If he didn't feel something, he wouldn't do it. He distinguished reverence from piety, a word he even avoids saying. He would say that reverence is like incense, while piety is just perfume. That's a nice way to understand the difference. Reverence is like incense, and piety is like perfume. So the elders' reverence encompassed not only a small and seemingly unimportant matters, but also spiritual and essential issues. He said, he taught, if someone neglects the little things, the danger is that he'll start neglecting the greater, holier things. And that reminds us of the words of our Lord when he said to the Pharisees, you should have kept both the one and the other, both the greater and the lesser things of the law. So uh, if we're, you know, we need to pay attention to the minor details, and that'll, that'll make us much more sensitive to the greater and holier things. And then he goes, without realizing it, this person will rationalize everything to himself. This is not thing, this doesn't matter, and he can end up, God forbid, totally, totally neglecting the things of God and becoming irreverent, arrogant, and atheistic. So the elders' reverence could be seen in a way he prayed, he venerated icons, he received a dinner, took holy water, partook of holy communion during processions, chanted and arranged and beautified the small chapel of his hermitage. Uh, he paid attention to details, but in a way that wasn't ritualistic or fastidiously formal. So I want to comment here something I said before about Elder Ephraim and other uh, holy men of our age is that the way that you can tell of a holy man is not what he says, but how he acts, how he sits, how he prays, how he talks, how he walks. And this is something very similar to what they just said here by Elder Paisos. So you can see how his reverence, rather, see, you get to use the right term, uh, in all that he did, chanted, how he arranged things, how he uh, walked, talked. Uh, it was his own attitude toward, attitude toward God, which wasn't laid out in advance by any typicon of the church. It was his personal disposition. He felt this whole permanence, not just his chapel, was a sacred place. He arranged his cell where he prayed. It's like a little church. There was an iconostasis with many icons and a lamp that burned continuously, and he would sense and light many candles there. He had constructed his bed so that it was like a coffin, and he would say, this is the altar of my cell. Icons and holy books never touched his bed with the exception of an icon at its head. This icon was rather tattered and faded. A brother once asked him why it was in this condition. The elder tried to hide the truth, but the monk finally realized that it was like that because of his many kisses and many tears. The elder reluctantly admitted, I, can't, I can get through an entire vigil that way, weeping. He also treated the other areas of his hermitage with reverence, the workshop where he made the little icons, the guest house where souls were born by grace, God's grace, the balcony, the, even the yard. He thought that it was irreverent to have a toilet made, uh, to have a toilet inside his hermitage. It was probably for aesthetic reasons, but that he kept it at such a distance, but also mostly out of reverence. Once when he was away from the hermitage the Holy Cro of the Holy Cross, the fathers in the monastery, out of love, so he wouldn't be unable, made him a small outhouse outside, but sharing a wall with the hermitage. The elder never used it. Kanaguda, the other place that he lived, when his health had deteriorated during the end of his life and he needed to go out frequently at night in cold rain or snow, his spiritual children began to building him an outhouse just clear of the balcony to make things e easier for him. And he refused. He said, that's where the Panagia appeared. How can I go to the toilet there? So you can see how sensitive he was to not just the church or the icons, but his whole house, his whole hermitage. His whole way of life and he didn't see god as many people seem to want to put him in our western world into a little box on sunday in church only but throughout his day god and holiness and reverence in everything and every place and that would um, 
you know, there would not be this limitation, this limitation to spiritual life. So it's very important for us to, to remember this, not to car compartmentalize our life, not to, to, to think in terms of, uh, now I'm in church, now I'm in front of God, uh, now I'm on my own, now I'll just relax, now I'll, nobody's around, so I'll do this. Uh, nobody sees me, I'll, I'll, I'll drink this, or I'll, uh, you know, lay, lay down this or whatever. So, of course, there's, there's a, a double people and we're irreverent or immodest because then we scandalize other people but the point is that if you don't do it alone do it in front of other people in other words to, to sit or act or speak irreverently or immodestly so uh, if we feel god is always in our life and present uh, then we make those distinctions between our time in front of other people or with other people and our time alone the elder's life was fragrant with deep and reverence, just as the angels in heaven God by day and by night with great reverence. This was clear to see from his relationship with God and from the expressions on his face when coming into contact with sacred things. He reacted to sacred objects as though they were alive. Once when Elder Paisus was visiting the hermitage of another monk, his hernia, he had hernia problems all his life, was bothering him. The elder of the hermitage begged him to lie down and rest a little, but Elder Paisus refused. He was only able to lie down on his left side, and if he had done that there, his feet would have been pointed at some icons, which he thought of as irreverent. So, you know, this is something that obviously can never be imposed. It's not a rule of life. It's not a canon of the church. Uh, it's something that has to come from within, from within this sensitivity, and you can't really judge it understand it because it's a it's it's something that's internal in the soul it has to do with their their relationship to this to the grace of god so when we feel that god, uh, depart or come closer obviously that's going to affect uh, the things we do and that's something beyond logic and observation before entering the holy altar he would make a proclamation he had a chapel in his cell so he had an, had an altar there before entering the holy altar, he would make a prostration to the floor, remove his monastic cap, and kiss the cross on the altar curtain. And then he would enter the side door. During communion, him in liturgy, he would, if he intended to commune, he would make full prostrations. For a time, he had it as a rule to eat nothing for 33 hours before holy communion. Because of his great reverence to the mystery of the priesthood, the elder never assented to ordination even though, as he once said, it's been revealed to me three times that I could become a priest. Plainly, the elders' reverence is a fundamental virtue for every Christian. Although rigorous as the criteria were, he considered it something rare. To the elder, reverence was greater than most of the other virtues. He often used it as a criteria. A reverend person wrote or said or did something for which he was criticized. The elder, even before forming a clear opinion of the issue itself, would go out of his way to propose mitigating circumstances. He would say, he's a reverent man. I don't believe he'd do something like that. The elder believed that he preserved a person from making errors, from deceptions, and from falling, perhaps in this sense, in the sense of the verse declaring that the Lord will carefully guard the way of those who reverence him. Let me say something about this. This is something so basic and so fundamental to orthodox christian spiritual life and, and theology which is being lost uh, this idea that reverence preserves one from making errors from deception plani or prelest and from falling into sin so uh, we we're, we're being more and more by the by the very rationalistic idea that uh, errors are an intellectual question and people can make errors because they just don't understand it intellectually. But that's actually not, in a, we're talking about errors pertaining to God, okay? not not errors in mathematics or something. But we're talking about errors pertaining to God, piety, reverence, um, the things of God. Uh, so a basic prerequisite for spiritual enlightenment is this reverence, this, this, this evlavia, this love of God. And when it's when it's lacking, then then it's inevitable that we're going to make errors. And I think you can see that on a human level. If you think, um, 
you know, if, if, a, if a man and a, let's take an example of a couple married, if a man and a woman are, are very much uh, love one another in a spiritual way uh, and reverence one another, uh, the, there's going to be far less times that they're going to fall into um, judgmentalism, uh, believe lies, their wife or husband, uh, you know, fall into to different sins. It's going to be, they're going to be preserved from that because of their great love and reverence for their wife or husband. So I think that's, uh, that, that, that is so much more the case on the spiritual plane. Uh, the elder considered reverence to be extremely important in all of a Christian's life and struggles, and especially those of a monk. A person's reverence, he believed, acts as a steady factor in affecting everything, raising his spiritual level. Uh, truly, if one, if one does not have great love and reverence for God, then his spiritual life is going to wane, and the passions are going to creep in, and it's going to become cold. And this can happen to anyone. He advised monks to take care of to acquire reverence. A new monk especially has to be reverent through and through. It helps for him to always have the Evergetinos, the book, it's called uh, one of the books of the Saints of the Fathers, uh, to always have that open and to spend time with other monks who are reverent. When a new monk asked the elder what it was that he should pay the most attention to, the elder replied, reverence and attention to yourself. A Russian bishop presented with many candidates for the priesthood once asked the elder, whom should he ordain? Those who are reverent and pure, the elder answered. He did not say educated or energetic uh, men or candidates with good voices. In chanting and iconography, also reverence was more important than the, to the elder than technique. He was able to discern his presence in chanting or in an icon. He would say, if you pay attention to the meaning of parian, it'll change you, and you'll be able to chant it in a reverent way. If you're reverent, if you're reverent, you might make a mistake while you chant, but it'll come out sounding sweet. If you only pay attention to technique, I mean going by note by note without a reverent spirit, then you'll end up where I once heard. He was chanting, blessing soul like a blacksmith striking an anvil. I heard it in a car, disturbed me. I told the driver to turn off the tape. When someone doesn't chant from the heart, it's like he's running out of running you out of church. The sacred canon said that people who chant improper voices should be given penances because they drive people away from the church. Uh, so I'm going to stop there because I could go on another page and a half uh, and we could open up to questions. But I think that you get the point here how important Evlavia or reverence uh, is in the spiritual life. And another way to put it is that all of our ascetic struggles everything that we're doing and of course asceticism is not just fasting and prayer it's not great feats of you know um, self-denial asceticism is everything we do which is an expression of our love for god so another word to say asceticism is love love for god so we do what we do for god we how we sacrifice for for, for having communion with god so if this is not done with love and reverence, obviously, uh, it's not going to have benefit. It's not going to be beneficial. Um, so many of us are are, are, are still, let's say, uh, limited to the externals. And we're trying to break through into a, a real personal, spiritual, uh, living relationship with the living God. Uh, and that is... Um, uh, this is why I, it's important to note what the elder is telling us here, that um, everything counts. All the thoughts we have, all the time we have alone or with other people in church or on the road, uh, all of it is going to contribute to whether or not we have a living, dynamic, personal uh, 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 communion with living God. And so here you can see how important that stance is, that, that position that we have. Uh, in our soul, how we how we make our way through the day, uh, with what reverence, and and how we shape our life in our in our cell, in our house, in our car, uh, all that's going to play a part, and it's going to contribute or not to breaking through and getting into beyond the externals, and having this this deep relationship, which then 
transfigures uh, the human being, and 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 all the all the uh, passions, including the great anxiety that people have today, uh, are chased away, uh, and a deep peace comes over over a human being, and, and they live they live in God. So, um, you know, it's really the basis the basis of all the other virtues. If you don't have this at lavia, this reverence this modesty, this love of the person of God, and then that it, it being applied and, and lived out throughout the day, then inevitably uh, you're going to get sucked into the spirit of the world and you're not, you're not going to make progress. So there's a, just a few words to, for, to see if we can, have any, we can have a discussion about this. I can keep reading if nobody has any other uh, questions, but I'd like to see if there's some questions. Yeah. Yeah, here comes the question, Chair. Uh, Father, so if Sevia, is there no way at any point, like, is that not a, a positive term? Like, I, I've always thought that someone, Oftos uh, Anthropos in Sevis, does it not have any uh, positive connotations? Is it really just, is it the. No, it, it, it's, it's, it depends on, I mean, a term is what you give it, is what you make of it. So, you know, if we could use the term positive. It's just that the, the elder wants to make this distinction. Uh, so he, made, he, he, used, he used words differently to make the distinction. Uh, and we could do it differently. I mean, you could say, you could say if Lavia and Evsevia are, are essentially synonymous, you know, piety and reverence are synonymous. And then you could talk about pietism as, as opposed to piety as being the negative. I mean, so the term, the term itself is not, not the problem or the issue. And, and in English, because we, uh, um, I don't, think, I don't think reverence is even used in, in this context very often. He's a reverent person. It's not very common you hear that. So this is a kind of way to, to give the Greek um, to, to, in English to, to translate the Greek, but I don't think we use it nearly as much as he's a pious person. We say all the time, he's very pious, and we mean reverent. We mean evlavis, like elder, the elder places means. Is it kind of almost like a distinction when we say uh, uh, this person is tapinos compared to tapinologia, like that, that fake? Uh... That's another that's another way to, to to make out the distinction. You know, he's uh, um, he's truly he's truly humble, not just uh, us, you know putting on airs of humility or something. Um, I'm sure there are other other examples too, like mo true modesty as opposed to uh, an external. Uh, you know, uh, strictness in appearance or something. So uh, probably every virtue, you could say there's a true, true expression of that virtue and then a fake put on uh, version or side of the virtue. So I don't think we need to, yeah. we don't need to get bogged down on the terminology. The, the essence of the thing is what we want to, and I think, I hope you understood the essence of the thing, which is, um, uh, you know, from the heart and throughout the day, and and not just um, for you know appearance sake. Go ahead, Dino. You want something? I, say something? I, I wanted to ask you something about virtues. Uh, so, in our spiritual struggles, sometimes uh, maybe we actually can grow a virtue, or maybe some virtues are maybe a little more natural for us. Like we have habits, if you will, spiritual. Mm -hmm. Some people. Uh, may not be as judgmental or some people maybe are more gifted at being patient or something like that for example some might be short-tempered or anger is very easy in their life if you're in a situation uh friends family where maybe you've tried you've struggled to cultivate a virtue and the other person maybe doesn't understand it as a virtue maybe even sees it as a weakness or they struggle with that uh, passion if you will uh, how should you approach it? For example, uh, maybe you try not to judge people, but someone else is judging and you're trying to explain that we're not trying, you know, we shouldn't judge people. Like, is it better to just stay quiet and try to lead by example, or is it better to try to explain how you, how you disagree and try to convince them to, let's say, not judge, for example? Well, that's going to depend on your relationship with the person. It's going to depend on how often you're together. It's going to depend on a lot of things. Uh, you need discernment in all these areas. But generally, the rule is by example. And then if you have a very close relationship, like with your wife or with your children, 
um, there might be more room to to be more to be more didactic and actually take it, you know, speak about these these issues. But I I would say generally as a rule, um, you know, those kind of things, those kind of interventions, those kind of teaching moments are going to happen. Uh, we would say in Greek, say an uh, In other words, not at the time of conflict, not at the time of of exchange, but at a time when there's peace and quiet. Uh, so let's say something happened. Something happened yesterday where there was a judgmentalness or something, and 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 we're trying to work on this virtue, and we recognize that this was a spirit of judgmentalness. And ju of course, we have to make the distinction. Judgmentalness today, many people think it just means to, 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 to make a judgment. And that's, that's not judgmentalness. Judgmentalness means to judge someone's soul, their spiritual state, their inner world, their eternal, um, their eternal uh, destiny. Uh, it, it's to take the role of God. So judgmentalness, when it's, it's not blessed, is uh, when I'm sorry, when judgmental is a, is a sin. It means that we've 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 we've, we've spoken as if uh, about things that are not are not in our purview and not uh, fall to us to make judgment. But God, on the other hand, calls us to to righteous judgment in terms of uh, virtue. Uh, you know, righteousness in the world, what is just, what is unjust, that, that, that's understood that we're going to have uh, the faculty and the ability and the, and the enlightenment of God to make right judgment. So uh, first of all, make, make sure we don't get confused and think we're, we're just going to sit without any kind of rational, critical analysis of things and, 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 and not judge what is right and true as opposed to what is, what is sinful. But in terms of people and their position and their souls and their hearts and their minds and their eternal position and, and place and how God sees them, obviously that's a sin, a sin and we need to avoid it. So let's say somebody did that and, and then it happened yesterday. At the moment, it's 99% of the time, it's not a good time. We do that though. We try to correct them right then because that's that's when the, the fever is uh, uh, of the exchange is highest. The best time is to let that go, not say anything. And the next day, at some opportune moment, or a couple of days later, or whatever it is possible, to talk about it without any kind of reference to that person and what they did, uh, but just generally, and then, and then prayerfully uh, um, offer that as a reflection or as a teaching, or maybe from the life of a saint or from the scriptures or something. Uh, and there, and that needs to fall on good ground. And so, at the time of ex heated exchange, there's no receptivity. So we don't. There's, there's almost no receptivity at that point. Many times, our silence can teach much better than our words. Uh, if we don't, if we don't participate in that judgmentalness, the conscience of the other person. Maybe maybe they'll smother it. Maybe they won't pay attention to it. But it works, isn't it? Deep, deeply and quietly, uh, if they want to hear, there's actually a, there's actually teaching going on without any words being spoken. And they can they get their conscience if it's sensitive, they'll pick it up. They'll say, "Oh, I'm doing this," and he's not saying anything, or she's not saying anything, and that means they're not participating in this. Maybe this is not what I'm doing. So. Uh, so I don't know. I hope that answers your question. I think that uh, we cannot impose ever any other virtue on anyone else. We can't expect them to be what we're trying to be. Uh, and uh, everyone is going through great trial and tr and struggle, and uh, um, everyone's dealing with different passions and different virtues. Different, you know. So there. So you, you or I might have been born with an inclination to do certain things because of our inheritance from our fathers and mothers. We're, uh, we've been taught or raised or we've been, we've been given that through uh, generations that we're more receptive to correction, we're more patient, we're more whatever. But then there's other things that, that, that you know, I'm, I'm much more um, 
uh, let's say, uh, immature about and not made any progress on. That's, that's where it is shown whether someone is making progress spiritually and becoming holy. They, they need to work on it are hard for them. Those things which you come easy, uh, those are gifts from God. And that there's not a lot of virtue in, 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 in exercising those. The ones that don't come easily. So let's say I'm a let's say I'm a very angry person. I just it comes easily to shout. If you see me change over the next six year and I become more meek, uh, that's that's very notable. That means there's a struggle going on, uh, the, a spiritual struggle to to become something else. And of course, that doesn't happen just in some kind of rational teaching mode or something that we do this. But it, it, it happens quietly, imperceptibly spiritually, eternally, and it happens because the grace of God has entered in and is transforming us. And, and we've, we've begun to pray and we've, become, we've begun, begun to live that reverence that the elders talking about. We're standing in the presence of God continually. That's what transforms someone from an angry person to a meek person. God working within them imperceptibly over time. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, you might meet somebody in the, in the winter and they're they're 10 or 15 pounds overweight and then you meet them in the end of august and they've lost all that weight uh i don't think it, it, unless you saw that big change if you had been with him all those eight months i don't think you would see that that they're losing that weight you know it might have been very it wouldn't be apparent apparent then all of a sudden you would say well this person's lost a lot of weight they've made progress uh, they've gotten rid of those those pounds because they've been doing you know in their in their on their own behind closed doors as it were they've been working on themselves and they're not eating as much and they're they're exercising more that's kind of how it works in the spiritual life those things happen imperceptibly and and and, be, and behind the the doors of our soul and um, the rest of us just see the results at the end thank you any other question Somebody, there was a young lady there that she disappeared though. Is she going? There's a more comfortable uh, chair to the side. Oh, uh, I see. Here she comes. Yeah. She's coming. Hi, hi, Father. My name is Despina. How are you? Hi, Despina. Thanks for that. Um, I had a question regarding um, your explanation of the word uh, semnotica. Yeah. Um, I was raised with, like, to believe with the understanding, I should say, that that word um, also referred to, like, demureness, if, if that's the correct way to, hmm. I think, translate it to English. So I don't know if that if that is the case, but in in my home and the way it was used around me, it, that that was also one of the definitions it was sort of given. Like Panagia was also semni, right? But as a virtue, not not as something, I don't know, like knife tay or something like this, like more more a, as something virtuous. So I don't know if that is in fact gives it a negative connotation. If I was wrong to understand it that way, um, perhaps you could perhaps you could Yeah. Uh, so demur in English is Reserved, modest, and shy, yes. or unassuming, meek, mild, reserved, quiet, shy, bashful, etc. That's what you want to. That's what you want to say. Yeah, and, and in part, I think that's that's perhaps one of the one of the senses that could be given to the word. I mean, I, I could be completely wrong, but that's so. I, I was wondering well, a lot about I, one of the points I was trying to make was that modesty is so is so as all the virtues are, but even. But in particular, modesty is so closely connected to humility and to meekness. Uh, and, and so uh, you can't really speak about modesty separate from humility. And the mother of God was, uh, you know, uh, the height of humility and modesty. So uh, so I'm, I, I, don't, I don't think that's, to, I don't think it would be incorrect to say um, uh, that modesty is close to uh, being reserved, uh, shy, uh, shy seems to go. That doesn't. One can be very modest and not shy. Seems to me. Yeah. Is that was that was that your question? Can those two can those two be different? Basically, do you have to be shy to become modest? No, I don't think so. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. I wonder if there was anything else. 
Uh, I'm trying to think if there was anything else I asked you. <laughs> yeah, meekness, however, I think is is something closely connected to modesty. But not there's not always you know meekness is not always you can have someone who's modest and not necessarily meek uh, um, in the sense of meek being. I mean, that that seems to be closer to someone's character than it does necessarily. Um, it, it's going to be expressed in each person differently, slightly differently. I don't think everybody's going to become this cookie cutter kind of, you know, we have a certain image of meekness and then everybody's going to become, no, it's not going to work that way. It's going to be a variety of people and a variety of expressions. But uh, so the virtues, the virtues are very dynamic in that sense. You know, each person kind of inc incarnates them differently, slightly, and depending on the mixture of the soul with the different, uh, the different virtues. Um, I, I, the thing that always stuck out in my personal experience, I don't know if this is helpful, but uh, there was a model for me in Greece of a modest priest. And, and, and so he's, he, you know, experientially, I think you have to have that. You have to have someone, you have to know somebody who's modest or meek or humble. And then he becomes like your standard, your, your, your example. And so these words are not just theoretical, but they actually take on flesh and blood. And so when I think of someone, I'm a priest and he was a priest, so he becomes a great example for me. But I mean, in your life, you can find, if you're a woman in your life, a mother, a daughter, a sister, or a grandmother, somebody who was, who had this virtue of, of modesty, they might become, uh, you know, a great example. Of how do I, how do I incarnate that? How do I? How do I live that out, that virtue? But it, again, it's going to be very dynamic and, and, and unique. Everybody's unique. And so those virtues are going to, are going to appear in different people in different ways. But the point I want to make is it's not limited just to externals by any means. And that's, I think, what the elder is also saying. And he connected it to, um, you know, humility and, um, how did he put it, modesty and... Uh, yeah, I don't see it here. Let's see. Uh, modesty and care. There was care, you know, prosectikos. Uh, so you want you want somebody who's who's who's, who's modest and and just reckless. Those two really don't go together, do they? You know. He's, he's reckless with his tongue. He's criticizing people, or he's saying things that are out of, out of time and place, and he's embarrassing people. And yet, he, we think of him as modest. I don't think those two would go together. So the, you see, they're all connected. They're, they're so they're so close. These virtues. So you make progress in one, you're gonna you're gonna end up making progress in another. Thank you, Father. There was one more question, actually. Um, uh, Costandino had asked about, um, you know, what's the best way to deal with. Uh, sort of situations where people are kind of um, have challenging behavior? Do we do we just try to um, be patient and um, lead by example? Or do we sort of call them out on what they're doing, confront them? And I believe your, your answer was that it's always best to lead by example. Uh, and I'm just wondering, I, I mean, of course, if you can be patient and, and endure um, someone's you know, um, anger or someone's uh, abusive behavior and, and that sort of you leading by example, that's great. But I'm wondering, is there a point, is there a point at which you, you sort of create distance and that's okay to create distance because you feel it breaks your spirit? Is there a point at which you can, you can sort of quote unquote ignore them and that that's still Christian because, you know, it, you feel it's affecting you in a really adverse way? And, and when do, how do we know what that point is? Yeah, those are all th those are things that all require discernment uh, in the time and place. There's no one answer for that. Uh, uh, there's there's great examples of spir of spiritual struggles who who are who are tremendously patient with other monks or or, or just in, in conditions of life where uh, they were in abusive situations and they they were greatly patient and but in that patience they became purified and holy and united to God. So those are kind of a greatest. Uh, Askisis, right? So there's if there's someone in our life, or a husband, or a brother, or whatever, who's a part of our life, and 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 we're not really 
able or not really blessed to distance ourselves from that person, then it becomes a question of uh, ascesis. Like this is our this is our padvik. This is our, our 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 ascetic struggle to be patient with this person. You know, a son or a daughter or a mother or a father, or whatever. But there are other situations where someone is not um, that a part of our life in that kind of organic way, and th and they. Uh, the spiritual father could say to someone, you know, you, you should just avoid that person because your presence, you're not, you're not at the point where you can deal with that person in any po positive way. Uh, you won't be able to person. Uh, and so therefore just keep a distance. That, that, that's certainly possible, uh, but that requires the discernment of a spiritual father and, his, and, and what is the best thing for both souls. Um, not, n there's no one answer for every situation you have to be patient, you have to cut. Uh, it really depends and it, and it requires discernment. So um, so it's not unchristian to say, uh, I'm not gonna continue uh, on a daily basis being with you know this person because there's no spiritual benefit here. I can't help them. They're not, li I'm not their spiritual father. I'm not responsible for them. I'm not, um, you know, it's not God's will that I, that I, I, I do that. I'm not I'm able to help them where I'm at spiritually. So therefore, I'm going to keep a distance. But it's possible. But I, I would say it needs the discernment of a spiritual father to, to be sure. If you don't have a spiritual father uh, who can discern that or is not near you, then then it, things are a little more difficult. But uh, you, you need to have a situation differently. Thank you. I hope that's an answer. It's not much of an answer, is it? No, it is. It is an answer. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about tonight, which I didn't talk, I didn't bring up? I mean, you know, today's uh, uh, the ninth, ninth day after the Mother of God uh, in Greece. They're having liturgies in a lot of places for the feast. Uh, I didn't talk about that, but uh, I don't know, maybe there's some other subjects you want to bring up and anybody wants to talk about in terms of their spiritual life, be, by all means, they can do that. It can be like, it doesn't have to be on the topic that I chose. There's there's all kinds of things we could talk about. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's, it's called apodesis, right? Yeah, but in most places today is the apodesis or the leave taking in English. Uh, in Amarathos, actually, the leave taking is at the end of the month. So the feast goes on um, until the, I want to say the 28th, on the 28th on the old feast, but on the church calendar, it goes on for several weeks. I can't remember the exact leave taking, but in most places in Greece, in the parishes, the ninth day is, 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 is the leave taking of the feast. Yeah. So that's also the. Uh, um, well, of course, by tradition, we and by the, the Holy Church of the Church, the Mother of God, on the third day, uh, the tomb was opened for the veneration of uh, Apostle Thomas, and and there was no body found in the tomb, and and the Church uh, teaches that the Mother of God, um, of course, uh, died bodily, but. Um, uh, Partly metastasy. In other words, there was a, a kind of analipsy or ascension of her body in the heaven as the first fruits after, the, after Christ of the resurrection. So, so the ninth day is a special a special day uh, in terms of the feast of the Mother of God. Go ahead. You want to ask a question? Um, yes, Father. Thanks. So, I, I was wondering if you could please um, distinguish for me the differences between. The um, the way that the uh, the Orthodox teaching or understanding of the Dormition of the Mother of God compared to the Catholics, um, um, the mm -hmm. Catholic has the assumption. So, um, what's the difference between the teaching of of each, please? As far as I understand it, I've done any particular studies, you know, particular. Um, examinations like I have other issues uh, in terms of Roman Catholic or Latin theology but in, as far as I understand it the Latin uh, theology is that the mother of God uh, did not die 
uh, but was was taken into heaven, so was ass assumed into heaven. Uh, so there was no death. Okay. Uh, now, I might be mistaken, but that's my understanding. And that, I think that flowed from this teaching of the Immaculate Conception, which is that the Mother of God, in her, con her conception, not the conception of Christ, but her conception in the womb of her mother, uh, St. Anne, was immaculate, meaning there was no inherited sin or ancestral sin or original sin, depending on the terms you use. So because there was no original sin, there was also no death. And the mother of God was preserved from one and then preserved from the, uh, the other. So there's a logical consistency there. These doctrines were made very late in the 19th and 20th century. The 19th century was uh, 18, I think, 1854, I'm, I don't remember, 1850. Uh, the the doctrine of the immaculate conception was was ratified, dogmatized, and then in nineteen I don't remember either nineteen thirties I think nineteen forties fifties the dog of the assumption was also uh, uh, ratified by the Pope. So these are doctrines, and of course we we take issue with both of them uh, because we teach that the the fathers of the church teach that. The mother of God is like any other human being, born uh, uh, by in, in, a, in a miraculous and glorious way, in the sense that Saint Anne was advanced in age, and um, so it was given by God uh, after much prayer and, and and much love on the part of uh, Joachim and Anna, but just like another human being, and. And in fact, if she was not born this way, then she would not be like us. And therefore, the nature of our human nature would not have been assumed by Christ when he was born. And therefore, there would be a serious problem in terms of our, our salvation. Because we're saved because he became like us, right? Except for sin. He did not take sin, take on sin, or, or, or in any way um, have sin. But he, our human nature was assumed, and therefore it was whatever was assumed was saved. And if it was not assumed, it was not saved. That was one of the basic teachings of the Church Fathers, St. Gregory Theologian, and others who, who insisted on the um, God and man being fully God and fully man. And so in a, in, a, in a very unfortunate way, this Latin dogma actually undermines, and from our perspective, undermines um, the very foundation of our salvation. If somehow the mother of God is different than the rest of us and does not take on our human nature because she's been closely separated off, and this and this sinlessness is actually not a result of her struggle or her piety or uh, her reverence, however you want to say it, uh, and her love and her virtue, but it's just a gift given to her, then then it's actually not virtue because virtue is not just that which is given. It's that which is simulated and willfully with a good disposition. So there's a lot of problems with that teaching. And then uh, in terms of her mission, we, just like our Lord died and was buried for three days, so that, so was our, uh, the mother of God. I mean, she was a human being. Death had to come to her because of the common lot of us all. But she, the resurrection is what it was promised and what was given. And that resurrection happened for her. Uh, because it would not be uh, theo proposed, it would not be, uh, 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 let's say, uh, appropriate to God for to remain in the tomb and for there to be decay of her body, which gave birth to the to the to the God Man. And so, in, in the first fruits of our resurrection, uh, we see already in the Mother of God. She's bodily in heaven, uh, in in a miraculous spiritual way, just like her son. So you can see the two teachings are uh, are pretty important, and they affect our understanding of our own salvation, how that's all worked out, the mystery of our salvation worked out. And unfortunately, that in the West, another layer of division between the Latin Roman Catholic communion and the, and the church. And, uh, and it goes back to, uh, if you go back, there's a great book, in English, you can read by Saint, uh, by, by uh, Father John Romanini's Ancestral Sin. I recommend it if you've got the patience and you're you're interested in this. Uh, it's a it's a thick book with lots of patristic text, but you can see in there he had the, the error in the West going back to Blessed Augustine of misunderstanding what ancestral sin is. 
original sin is. So that's where all the problem starts. And then they, and then they, not understanding what ancestral sin is, they, they, they have this need to free the mother from it. And it's very kind of a rationalistic way of looking at, at, at this mystery of salvation. And then they have this need, if she's freed from it, then she's also freed from death, and therefore she's assumed. And there's a whole ch there's a chain reaction of three dogmas that are erroneous, and they begin from a misunderstanding of what happened in the fall. So it's all, it's, you know, like the virtues, theology is all connected. It's all connected. So one, one, one thing, if you get one thing wrong, you're going to end up getting other things wrong as well. For sure. Thank you. That's uh, very interesting. Thank you. That helps. And there's a great book by St. John Maximo. You can read And he goes a whole chapter into this. St. John Maximovich, on the veneration of the mother of God, on the veneration of the mother of God, St. John Maximovich, you can read, there's a whole chapter dedicated to the Latin um, error. You can read that, it's in English. Yeah, St. John's a great, great book, all about the mother of God, the veneration of the mother of God, through all these important dogmas. Thank you, Father. Okay, no questions from, what's your name over here on the... Theophilos. Theophilos. Well, with a name like Theophilos, uh, we expect great things. <laughs> Friend of God. Well, uh, you don't want to not, not, I ask anything. Come not on. Courage. I have a question, not not related to what you were speaking, but uh, how do you forgive someone that has done a lot of wrong to you in your life? Hmm. <laughs> well. First of all, you, uh, from what he has done and look at who he is. She. That's the first. Or she. Yeah. Yes. So you have to get away from what she has done. And, and, and what we do is not, okay. And who are we? Who are, each one of us is made in the image and likeness of God or the, is, is, an, is an image which is marred and the likeness is lost, but we were originally made for, glorification and deification and god every one of us including this person um is uh, is still uh, working uh, and loving and seeking the communion with this person and so if we remember that remember that she's she's a victim as we are to the enemy of our salvation we remember that she is uh, full of uh temptations and has passions like we do uh, if we if we remember that uh, in terms of who she is, uh, and we get away from what she has done, and we realize that these passions are to her detriment, and maybe even to her eternal damnation, and we begin to feel compassion for her. We seek to love God. We see God in her. We see that she's still uh, beloved of God. And because we want to be in communion with God, we have to be in communion with his creation. And, and we remember that um, we are fallible, sinful, uh, wretched people who have passions and, uh, and, 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 and we have a common uh, frailty with this other person. And we begin to see ourselves and our own sinfulness and sickness. And then we become, we become grateful to God for his patience with us. And this helps us become... Um, we see ourselves and we see them in this common condition of fallenness and sickness and we don't we don't blame them hold a vengeance or grievance against them because uh we see that they're victims and that these things are actually to their detriment and what they've done is not an expression of their but a, a, a departure from it and a, and wars against it and so therefore they're they're really, um, uh, but also we have to see ourselves that we're very sinful and weak. And, um, and when we begin to see ourselves, then we don't look at them as much. And we, we realize how gracious God is with us and we become more patient with others. And then also we have to remember the words of our Lord. He says, when you forgive the sins of others, then the sins of your sins will be forgiven. So there's a, there's a, there's a connection there. Uh, that is in that 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 makes that flows from our common humanity. So, how can we be in heaven with God if we're 
separate from our from our fellow humanity, uh, fellow human beings. We can't. And the Lord says the, the, that's a prerequisite for communion with God that we've forgiven the others. You know, forgive us our sins. We forgive those who sinned against us. Right? Those two things go together. So, do we want to be saved? Do we want to be in communion with God? Do we want to be eternally with Him? Then, then we have to work diligently to forgive others. That's 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 part of being saved because salvation is communion with God and becoming like God. God forgives everyone. God loves everyone. God is in communion with everyone as much as they allow Him. Uh, and if we want to be with God and be like God, then we need to do the same. We fight that. We actually fight in our communion with God. The, the, as, as much as we fight forgiving, or we can't forgive, or we have vengeance, actually we're fighting our own salvation, of our own uh, passions. Uh, the Lord was on the cross, and he looked at everyone and said, forgive them for what they do. They do not know what they do. Uh, this is a, this is for our benefit. He, everything he did was for our benefit. So we, this this even this on the cross was to show us what we must do to be saved. Saved, in other words, to be in communion with God. So not only um, uh, must we uh, see her for what she is, the other person for what they are, the image of God, see what God is doing with them and with us, and be grateful, see our own sins and passions, and then become more patient with other people. But in fact. All of this is bound up with our own salvation, and in so much as we don't do it, we are distanced from God, and we're not like God. And being like God is part of our salvation, right? We were created in the image and the likeness of God. The, the image was marred and is marred with sin, and the likeness was lost. Our whole struggle in the church is to acquire that again, to become the image likeness again. Likeness means what he is, we are too. He forgives everyone. He loves everyone. He's in communion with everyone. We must we must be that as well if we're going to be with him eternally. So it's in our it's on our our it's, just, it's an issue of salvation for us to forgive. If if we don't, then we're endangering our own our own souls. So don't look at the, what they've done. You have to stop looking at what the people have done to you, and look at what God has done for you and forgiving you and communion with you. I mean, when we were sin, sinners, and when we are, we are sinners, he came and died for us. Uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's impossible to fathom the love of God for us. And if, if we can just focus on that and his great love, and we'll stop looking at these, these very temporary to us, these difficulties, trials, tribulations that we've suffered in this world, and we'll see that they're actually for our benefit as well. Elder Bice arrived at the point where he was giving great, great he was giving uh, thanks to God when people would um, treat him unjustly or do un injustice to him or call him names or call him whatever. He, he, he realized that this was uh, a spiritual benefit for him. And it, it made him draw closer to God because that's what they did to Christ. Right? So if we really want to imitate Christ, we won't look at these things as obstacles or as something evil, but we'll look at them as part of the pedagogy of God and the process of our purification. So they call us names. Uh, they, they're unjust to us. That's a part of this mystery of our need to be purified and to become like God. He suffered also for us. Thank you, Father. That's a very good explanation. Good. I'm happy. I want to give good explanations <laughs> to help you. So, uh, Father, should we wrap it up? We can do that. That's I, I, yeah. yeah. That's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So son kiri don laon so se vlogi son di glirono mi an su ni kastis vasilensi 
Διεφώνω εκεί που τα είμαι ο κύριος που στέλνω στο λέει στους όσους εμάς. Αμήν. Βοηθιά σας. Βοηθιά σας. Ευχαριστώ. Καληνύχτα. Καληνύχτα.